It's called Dabs, motherfucker. What's my shit, bitch? Hey there, YouTube. Bed Bath and Bongs here. Thank you for joining me. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be off the next couple days, um, due to me being off work for quite a little while, due to the COVIDs. Um, my schedule's a little out of whack, but I'll be off tomorrow and Tuesday, so expect a lot of content. So far, um, you know, Biden's presidency hasn't even started, and we are see seeing a couple hopeful developments. Uh, Bernie Sanders, of course, is gonna be the budget chairman in the Senate. Um, the Dems are going to have a slight majority in both the House um, and the Senate, and then we're going to have a Democratic president. So we might actually be able to get some things done. And then Bernie Sanders, he's talking about um, using the reconciliation budget protocols to actually pass some bills that would benefit the people instead of corporations and, uh, you know, the upper crust scum, as I call them. If we lose Georgia, Bernie Sanders is the budget chairman. If we lose the Senate, do you know who becomes the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee? In 2016, Paul Ryan said Republicans should be scared of Democrats controlling the Senate because Bernie Sanders would be the budget chair. A guy named Bernie Sanders, you ever heard of him? Bernie's budget, Bernie Sanders speaking out on spending priorities. The Senate Budget Committee is really one of the most powerful in Congress because it controls the money. Sanders has been creating a new stimulus package that could include an emergency universal health care program so that anyone can get medical treatment during the pandemic, whether they currently have insurance or not. We are proposing to raise the minimum wage so that people can earn a living wage. The American people are hurting for them. What do the American people want, Vincent? They want us to create jobs. They want us to rebuild a crumbling infrastructure and create millions of jobs. We now have the opportunity to move this country forward with a very different set of priorities. Sanders has no problems being loud and bold. Bernie is a man of his convictions. I think the job of many of us is to keep banging away over and over again and ask why it is that we end up having millions of people sleeping out on the street. My friend Bernie Sanders, everything I know, more passionate, devoted ally to working people in this country. Senator Sanders says that he will use budget reconciliation process to boldly address the needs of working families. We're talking about moms trying to feed their kids, people worried about being thrown out on the street. The landlord here has started an eviction process against us. Never thought I'd be in this situation ever. I have no money for rent. If we get kicked out of our house, where are you going to go? One out of four corporations has not pay a nickel in taxes. We are going to start to tax the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations. We just voted the largest military budget in the history of this country, $740 billion. The Pentagon can't even do an independent audit. There's an enormous amount of waste in that budget, but no one worries about that. When it comes to the mom and dad who are struggling to put food on the table for their kids, oh my God, we're worried about the deficit. I need help because I'm about to be homeless. What our job has got to be is to bring people together around an agenda that is in fact supported by the vast majority of the American people. And then Biden, he unveiled his uh, $1.9 trillion stimulus plan that includes more direct checks to Americans. Be another $1,400 um, for each person, which would be a total of 2000 like should have been in the initial bill. I mean, it's a good start. Um, I feel like UBI might be something that would be of great benefit to the average person and to the economy as well as stimulus. Uh, you know, courtesy of people like Andrew Yang, who have helped popularize the idea. Maybe this will be the beginning of uh, installing something like that. And it does give me a little hope that we can push this moderate Republican a little bit to the left. I feel like he's just a slimy, uh, reptilian-like politician. So maybe if we keep the pressure up, um, maybe we can actually get some shit done. I don't know. We'll see. 
The next president, President-elect Joe Biden, he's laid out his new massive $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan. It includes money for testing, vaccines, opening schools, and direct payments to millions of Americans. ABC News business correspondent Deirdre Bolton joins us with more. Deirdre, so what stands out to you from this massive proposal, and what would it mean for the economy? $1.9 trillion plowed into it. Terry, you used the word massive. You listed some of the components. This is what stands out. It is ambitious by anybody's measure, but it's by design. I think one of the lessons that we collectively learned from coming out of the last recession, 2007 to 2009, was that a piecemeal strategy really didn't work, and the recovery for the U.S. economy honestly just took a lot longer than was necessary. So I think this is the president-elect's version of go big or go home, build this bridge, if you recall from his statements last night, he used that specific word more than a few times, just in fact saying, let's support people, let's support businesses, let's support families until vaccines are a little bit more widespread and until all of us are more collectively comfortable going and spending in restaurants, indoor or outdoor, traveling, staying in hotels, just until this moment where the vaccines are widespread. And Terry, you know this well, our collective spending is two thirds mm -hmm. of our economic power. So the way that we all feel about being places and being together and being entertained and being in the same room, that's a huge part of our economy, Terry. And we got to get those shots in arms. But due to this plan is also notable because it would be all deficit spending, meaning it, it, there's no balancing it with spending cuts or tax increases. That's a completely different approach, isn't it, than we saw at the beginning of President Obama's terms. Uh, so what does that it, tell you? It, it, it sure is. And listen, Terry, whether it's us personally, it never feels good to be spending more than we're making. If you talk to individuals, they don't feel comfortable in that situation. It's not comfortable for a country to be in that situation. But the analogy that I hear often is that literally our house is burning down. Our economic house is burning down right now. So we don't want to be standing outside looking at this fire and saying like, oh, well, maybe the firefighters are going to cause water damage. The most important thing right now is just to hit this head on. I I spoke with Austin Goolsbee. He, of course, served in the Obama administration. And he was really talking about the fact that this is why we have this kind of flexibility. So yes, it's a little bit uncomfortable if you look at the balance sheet. But if we don't do this, the alternative is much, much worse in his terms. He said we're even at risk of a double dip recession if a plan like this is not put into place and passed by the new Congress, Terry. Such a huge challenge for the new president. Deirdre Bolton, thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Not to say everything's hunky dory because, you know, besides the fact that Bernie Sanders is in the position he is now, um, there's a reason why he wasn't picked for Biden's cabinet. And it's because he just wouldn't mesh well. Have you seen what Biden's cabinet looks like? It's nothing but national security, Raytheon executives, fucking uh, oil executives, lobbyists. It is who's who of the ne neoliberal and conservative handbag. It's just gross. It's disgusting. That part does not give me a lot of hope. Is who Biden has chosen to surround himself with for the most part. First cabinet position, I'm sorry, one cabinet official that I'm not a huge fan of is General Lloyd Austin who is Biden's pick um, for uh, uh, defense secretary. Um, in, in a story published by Bloomberg here, it's saying that uh, he's going to be earning as much as $1.7 million as um, sort of his uh, severance from the position he's giving up at Raytheon Technologies. He's saying that he is going to divest his financial interests which I don't really trust that. It kind of sounds like when Trump said he would divest his and he just kind of let his kids make the decisions and kept making his own money. That's not divesting. And he's saying that he will recuse himself for one whole year for making decisions at Raytheon. So that means after the year is over, he could still be defense secretary, I'm sorry, yes, defense secretary, and then continue making decisions for Raytheon. What a fake bullshit move that is. Um, 
Lloyd Austin, man, fucking terrible pick. And I, I don't really care about the fact that he's black or, you know, he's headed up all these operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. If anything, I hold that against him. He was a very heavy participant in an illegal war. Before we continue, let's blaze. Oh. <laughs> 